And I would like to introduce you to our two main speakers for today. Stacy Vieira is a writer, communications expert, and DC area native, and has been a master food volunteer with VCE since 2016. Learning about nutrition, science, and food safety with extension agents led her to earn a master's degree in public health nutrition last year. She lives in South Arlington, where she aspires to plant as many tart cherry trees on her property as she can. Also joining us is Aisha Salazar, as our family and consumer science extension agent. She supervises the Master Food Volunteer Program in Arlington and Alexandria. She is a Master of Science in Biohazardous Threat Agents and Emerging Infectious Diseases and degrees in biology and psychology as well. She's a DC native and has worked in the areas of food, health, and science education for several years. All right, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Aisha. Great, thank you, Leslie. So today's outline, um, just wanted to share a little bit of what we'll be talking about today. We have three different parts. We will, in the first part, we will talk about the benefits of cooking, my plate, healthy eating from head to toe, herbs and spices, and leafy greens. And then we'll take a quick Q&A. Um, part two, we will have a cooking demonstration featuring Stacy um, with Christie's kale and sun-dried tomato salad. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the ingredients and then we'll do a Q&A. And then part three, we'll talk a bit more about some go-to garden recipes from our master gardeners, Anne and Trisha. We'll talk about uh, the organic vegetable garden at Potomac Overlook Regional Park. We'll have some community resources for you, uh, discuss some healthy eating strategies and provide some helpful links in books. And then we'll also have the Q&A at the end. So to start off, we'll just talk a little bit about some benefits of cooking. Um, in 2018, there was actually a literature review to see if cooking interventions could influence any psychosocial outcomes. Um, and that found that more research was actually needed and it may positively influence psychosocial outcomes, um, but it was preliminary and limited evidence that was showing this. Um, what is known is that the use of cooking as a strategy in therapeutic and rehabilitative settings. So for example, um, Cooking is used, um, it involves a lot of executive functioning and it's used as a tool for cognitive and physical evaluation and development. Um, so any patients needing therapy, uh, cooking is actually a, a skill that's provided for people to relearn some skills and see where they are in their development. Um, however, that being said, psychologists have said that cooking and baking are pursuits that fit a type of therapy known as behavioral activation. The goal is to alleviate depression by boosting positive activity, increasing goal-oriented behavior and curbing procrastination and passivity. So there are some cases where um, it's actually used in therapy to help improve um, anxiety and depression in patients. Um, so cooking has been known to help with improving social interaction, increasing self-esteem, improving your nutrition. Um, there are different benefits of cooking with children as well. Um, so one of the benefits of children is that you can help them develop an adventurous and varied taste palette, uh, encourages healthy habits. Um, it's better for your wallet. You can save some money by um, not spending as much money when you go out to a restaurant. And like I mentioned before, there's some questionable mental health benefits. Um, you know, more research needs to be done. Um, there's also some benefits um, to family dinners. Um, and actually, let me go back real quick. I mentioned that some of the better nutrition part uh, you can control what you eat. So you can reduce the amount of sodium or sugar in your diet uh, by adding whatever spices and herbs you have at home. Um, on the right side of this, you'll see some benefits of family dinners. Um, this is through the Family Dinner Project um, based in Massachusetts. And they give some examples, especially for youth, um, of why you should try to have a family dinner. And we'll use the term family in whatever capacity family means to you. So it could be your group of friends. It could be you. Um, and your spouse, it could be you and some children. Um, but in general, um, it doesn't help um, with conversation. It allows, um, there's a strong link with um, academic performance in children. Um, and then teens who uh, regularly eat family dinners are more likely to get A's in schools, like we said, uh, and can reduce uh, teenage uh, behaviors that are a bit risky. Um, but in general, you, you really wanna aim to have three to five meals per week with your family to improve some of these, to get some of these benefits. 
Stacey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Aisha. And thank you to Leslie and the Master Gardeners for having us today. Um, so you can see on the screen, this is uh, my plate and it may be recognizable to some of you. Um, my plate just celebrated its 10th birthday and looking at the image on this screen, I think it's easy to see why. It's a helpful reminder to fill half your plate with fruits and vegetables at every meal. And these five tips that you see on the left help, help us establish healthy eating patterns for life. So um, where, where I'm coming from is thinking that diet is a four letter word. Um, diets are usually only temporary and they can even be harmful if you exclude certain food groups, set extreme limits on what and how much you eat and, and it can cause fluctuations in weight gain and loss. So um, that said, if you need more specific guidance or require a medically tailored diet, please make sure that you do that under the supervision of a dietitian and or physician. Um, but what you hope, it, uh, what we hope that you take away from this session today is that eating right, you know, with the occasional treat sprinkled in here and there, um, it's a habit that we all need to uh, combine with physical activity, such as gardening, as sustainable ways to enjoy lifelong wellness. So again, the healthy eating tips from my plate, um, to reiterate what's on the screen, focus on eating whole fruits, um, less fruit juices varying your veggies, try a variety of different vegetables and lots of different colors, uh, make half of your grains whole grains, vary your protein routine, um, Just and we'll talk a little bit about that in our cooking demo and how to do that. And then um, choosing low fat or fat-free dairy or um, non-dairy products. Thanks, Stacey. So what you see on the screen now is an image of a young girl um, and some different fruits and vegetables and then some different body parts. So I wanted to see if you could uh, take some time and put into the chat, which of these fruits and vegetables you think might be good for your eyes? Do you think it's the tomatoes? Do you think it's the broccoli? Do you think it's the spinach? Um, go ahead and put that into the chat and just kind of see what you think it might be. And then I want you to also try that with um, foods that you think are good for your brain. So which foods do you think are good for your brain? And I see some squash and carrots for the eyes, I believe. Somebody else said carrots for the eyes. I think that's one that we all grew up learning about. All right, brain, purple potatoes. Yes. And actually those are sweet potatoes, but they do look purple. So I'll take that. <laughs> um, let's see, broccoli for bones. Yeah, I think most of you know this. Um, and then what about for your heart? Which of these uh, foods do you think are good for the heart? Tomatoes and strawberries for the hearts. That is a great guess. Okay, so that was kind of a trick question because as you can see from this image, a lot of these foods are actually really good for multiple parts of your body. Um, so fruits and vegetables are great for us. They reduce uh, the risk of some chronic diseases. And uh, for example, in this one, spinach, you can see is good for your teeth, good for your eyes, your bones, and your heart. Um, so spinach would be something you'd you should you know eat plentiful, eat a lot of. Um, the bottom line is you want to include at least, um, I think it's five to six servings in fruits and vegetables throughout your, your day. Uh, a serving, for example, would be a half cup of a vegetable, one cup of salad greens, or one piece of fruit. Um, fruits are typically low in fat, sodium, and calories, um, and they don't have any cholesterol. And they're a source of essential nutrients that many people don't get enough of, such as potassium or vitamin C. Vitamin A, just to give you a little bit more information, um, that helps you see better at night and see in color. And like some of you said, it's found in dark orange fruits and vegetables. So like the squash and the carrots, the sweet potatoes. Um, it's also found in dark leafy, leafy green vegetables. Um, so up here we had the spinach, the collards, um, you know, kale would fall under that as well. Um, vitamin C, it helps you fight infections. It also helps keep your muscles and skin healthy and helps heal cuts and bruises. 
Um, so some of your best choices for that would be your oranges, your strawberries, your red peppers, tomatoes, broccoli, for example. Um, and as you can see, this image also includes things that are not fruits and vegetables, but today we're just focusing on the fruits and vegetables. So when we take a look at leafy greens, um, I'm gonna let Stacey talk a little bit more about uh, when to grow them. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the nutritious side of them. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today um, we're primarily focusing on leafy greens. Um, and you know these are, are some examples on the screen of things that you can plant here in Virginia and, um, and then harvest them in the fall. So um, we're looking at things like, you know, collard, spinach, cabbage, lettuce, kale, chard. What all of these have in common are that, you know, deep, rich, leafy um, green, uh, deep, rich green leaf uh, uh, color on the leaves. And, um, and so if you have planting questions specifically about leafy greens, and then next we're gonna go to herbs, um, please make a note of that and then we can address it in um, our first Q&A break. And then moving on uh, to herbs. So, um, you know, things to, to plant, <clears throat> excuse me, now or in the summer, um, some you can grow outside and some, some work inside. You know, herbs, and what's, what's, uh, what is an herb? Herbs come from plants that are grown in temperate climates, um, like our, our region. And the leaves are typically part, the parts of herbs that are used in cooking applications. Spices, on the other hand, um, come from the bark, berries, the flower buds, roots, or the seeds of tropical plants. And, um, and so Aisha is gonna talk about, you know, uh, uh, leafy greens and herbs. Um, some of those that you see on the screen that you can grow here include um, you know, cilantro, dill, fennel is an herb, mint, make sure you grow it in a contained area or um, you will live in a mint jungle uh, on your property, <laughs> uh, rosemary, uh, thyme, a bunch of different ones. Um, and so then, like I said, Aisha is going to talk about sort of the, the benefits of these and how it, um, it works with uh, nutrition and, um, and staying healthy. Thanks, Cece. Um, so in general, some of the benefits of leafy greens and herbs, um, I mentioned before that fruits and vegetables can be low in calories. Um, they also don't cost as much. Um, they're easy to grow and can be locally sourced. Um, so if you don't have a garden, you can go to a local farmer's market and, and purchase some items there or at a grocery store. Uh, they're nutri nutrient rich. So they're excellent sources of vitamins A and C, which I mentioned earlier, um, and what those do. Vitamin K, which helps with uh, blood clotting. Um, they are important sources of minerals such as iron, calcium, and magnesium. So iron helps reduce the uh, blood cells. Calcium helps build strong bones and teeth. And then magnesium helps our muscles and nerves functions, uh, strengthens your bones, and keeps your heart beating strong. Um, they're loaded with antioxidants. Um, which are helped by uh, free radicals in your cells and your body, um, things like nitrates, lutein, and lycopene. And then herbs, they add lots of flavor with a little salt, sugar, and calories. Um, so Stacey mentioned you, you do wanna try to use those as much as you can to help season your foods. Um, and then the fats improve vitamin absorption. Um, they have vitamin C, like we mentioned before. Um, herbs have uh, a lot of flavor. And um, they're have, they have phytonutrients. So they're plant-based compounds that can help lower the inflammation and reduce risk of developing different cancers. Um, and some of these nutrients are best access, access raw or eaten raw. Some of them are better when you're cooked. Um, but like we said before, it's in general to have, good to have two and a half cups or at least three servings a day um, of fruits and, and then of some of vegetables as well. Um, bottom of the line, you just want to eat a variety of them. Um, different colors and cooked in a variety of ways. And greens can be a little bitter. Um, I don't know if you've tried some greens before, but they can be a little tough on, on the tongue, um, but they can have a strong flavor. So some ways that you can balance the bitterness um, is by um, adding some acids to it, such as citrus and vinegar, um, adding fats, which enhances the flavor and the nutritional value. Um, so Sometimes it can help you absorb 
uh, the nutrients better. Adding spices, like we mentioned, uh, with a little salt or salt alternatives. Um, you can pair them with bold flavors. So using different cheeses like feta and goat or blue cheeses, um, different Asian flavors, such as soy, sesame oils, uh, add some fruits in there, cranberries, apples, pomegranates that sweeten it up a little bit, um, some nuts and seeds to get some extra um, healthy fats in there as well. And then you can remove some of the tough stems um, and you can use those for other things if you need to. Um, and then try to pick greens before full maturity. Uh, Stacey will talk a little bit more about this later on as well. And when it comes to cooking greens, there's a variety of way to cook them. You know, you can eat them raw, like we said, have them in salads or smoothies or wraps. Um, you can add, you can boil them, you can saute them, you can braise them on the stove or in the oven or a slow cooker. Um, you can bake them, you can make kale chips, um, put them into casseroles or quiches, um, add them to the soups, soups and stews. Um, so for example, lamb stew with collard greens or kale, um, Italian soup with uh, chicory or escarole. You can act, add the cooked greens to pastas, um, act, add them to quiches like we mentioned, and then uh, things like enchiladas, for example. Um, so before we move on, I just wanna see if anybody had any questions uh, about anything that we've mentioned so far. Uh, so we have one question um, that's come in about uh, how much fat do we need in our diets? Um, they know we have a discussion about low fat and no fat, but acknowledge that we do need some. And so what's the right amount of, of fat in our diet? I'd be happy to answer that. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, it's uh, all about balancing. Um, and so when we're talking about macronutrients, when we say macronutrients, we're talking fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Um, and then the micronutrients are the vitamins and the minerals. Um, and so for uh, the balance that we're looking for is having about 20 to 35% of our calories from fat. How many calories is that is hard to say. Yeah, it depends on, um, on your own physiology and your needs, um, how active you are. Uh, all of it, all of those things factor into it. So, um, generally, you know, look, look for about, you know, a fifth to a third of your calories each day coming from fat. And like Aisha said, it really, um, we need fat in our diets. Um, we don't necessarily need whole fat, um, let's say whole fat milk, uh, but we can certainly you know, switch and have sort of a, a lower fat, uh, either one or 2% milk or uh, low fat uh, yogurt. Those are, are great sources of, um, of fat as well as other um, nutrients. And, um, and we'll talk later, but you know, we, let's, I want to talk about, um, especially in our, our demo, you know, how we uh, look at foods, at eating foods, not as nutrients, but as, um, but as foods themselves. And so something like yogurt can fall into, you know, both the fat and the protein and, and even some carbohydrate, you know, with the, the natural sugars that are in, um, that are in the, the milk and yogurt. So, um, Again, it's kind of the guideline is, um, you know, don't, don't fear fat, we need it. There's gonna be a little bit of fat in our, in our recipe that we're gonna do. Um, so that is really the, the best advice about a fifth to a third of our daily calories from fat. Nicole, I just wanted to um, expand on what Stacy said about growing uh, some of the leafy greens. The list that was um, on, the, on the screen, they can be um, sown, uh, late winter, early spring for um, an early summer harvest, or they can also be planted late summer for a fall harvest. And some of those can actually be overwintered, such as kale. Um, I am still harvesting kale. My kale has started to flower and I am using the stalks in, in recipes. Right. Yeah, it's a nice benefit of being here is we have this extended growing period in Virginia, which is really nice. Um, but okay, we're set for questions now, so we can move on. Thanks. All right. Fantastic. I'm going to switch screens and cameras so that you can see my whole um, cooking demo set up over here. And away we go. Um, well, away we go once I change the camera. 
there it is. Okay. So um, thank you all again uh, for your attention and um, hopefully some excellent, more excellent questions uh, today. So um, this recipe is from a graduate school colleague of mine who is also a registered dietitian. And like me, she believes, I'll come down here. <laughs> she believes in eating right and gaining the nutritional and emotional nourishment that comes from the food that we eat. You know, food is fuel, but it's also pleasure. And um, that's why I named my website, Every Food Fits. Um, it's also why I became a master food volunteer and transitioned my career into public health nutrition. And um, as you, I'm sure no, few things are more versatile in the kitchen than a recipe for a salad. So, and this one can, can change with the seasons and other foods that may or may not be available. So for instance, a Trader Joe, he has not had my favorite uh, type of sun-dried tomatoes for weeks. So instead of the sun-dried tomatoes in the photo that are traditionally used in the recipe, we're going to use grape tomatoes. Uh, grape tomatoes or other varieties like um, sun golds, other kinds of cherry tomatoes, they are abundant in area gardens when they're given the right soil and sun. And to, to me, the flavor of summer is a warm sun gold that is eaten at the end of the day, just right off the vine. Um, and so with all of that in mind, um, we'll, we'll check out our mise en place, which is just a French term for getting all the ingredients measured and tools ready to go for cooking. Um, and also I wanted to mention that if we were in person today cooking, um, I would have my hair covered and I would be wearing gloves, but today I'm in my home kitchen. So um, we're gonna, we're gonna be a little more loose with those uh, food safety rules. Um, but for now, let's walk through the recipe step by step, and I will share some other food safety and some frugal cooking tips. Uh, all right, so first we have um, the kale. And so the kale that you will have in your garden, uh, what I like to do is, um, is actually pick the kale when it's young. Um, Aisha mentioned this earlier. So we have this little baby kale and um, today I bought it at the grocery store because I haven't been able to grow it yet. Um, and if this were, let's say this is a large um, kale leaf, if you let it grow or get really big leaves at the grocery store, you can what you can do is take these large stems and you pull them out and so then what I do is either you know rip them or cut them first I wash them these are washed so um, have been pre-washed and come washed in the bag um, so it's actually a food safety concern <laughs> to wash the pre-washed stuff if you have it from the bag please don't wash it again you could contaminate it but um the uh kale that will come from your garden, what you can do with that is uh, rinse it off first, just with some water, then cut it um, after you pull the, the more bitter stems. And then after you cut it, do another rinse and that might make it a little bit less bitter. So um, now what we'll do is just the easiest part of the recipe, taking some of the kale and putting it from the bag here into the bowl and I'll do a at least a couple of cups of it and again you know some of these little guys they come with some more stem than I enjoy in my salad so I just like to take some of those off there we go okay now let's see uh the garlic so garlic can be kind of strong. Um, not everybody loves garlic. I have here, this is my yellow um, cutting board. I'm using uh, yellow for all of my alliums. So the, the garlic, the, uh, the onions, those sorts of things always um, make them on my, I, I always cut them and prepare them on my yellow cutting board so that the flavors don't uh, contaminate other fruits and vegetables. So um, what I did to, now you could use any old regular heads of garlic, but what I like to do to make it a little bit sweeter and, um, and milder is uh, I toasted these garlic cloves this morning 
It took about 15 minutes on medium low. You can see how they got a nice char. And of course, the the um, in this case, I left the uh, husk still on. Um, and I used my cast iron pan and I just put these guys right in the pan and watched them move them around with my tongs, not my fingers, because um, I, I like having all of my fingers. Um, and toasted these guys up until they're a little bit browned, um, almost blackened or a bit blackened. So now what I'm gonna do is uh, I have my compost bowl right here. I always have here this morning's coffee grounds and some of uh, the, the exterior of the garlic. And so these actually peel pretty nicely since they have been sort of pre-cooked. And now you can see that there's a nice little roast to these guys. And I wish we had smell-o-vision because it smells so, so good. One of these days we will, we will be in person and share these smells together again. Um, so I, my recipe says uh, one to two cloves of garlic minced. You know, what I usually do when I make a recipe is, um, especially for things like, um, especially for things like, uh, you know, garlic and, and onions, I prepare a bunch ahead of time. And then I have some in the refrigerator or um, some things I put in the freezer like onions. And uh, so I have them sliced or diced or uh, minced and then I have them at the ready when I need them. So, but for now, and I have a little prep bowl. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to make this uh, dressing a little bit more garlicky than uh, the recipe calls for. It says one to two cloves. I, you know what? I'll take, I'm going to do all four. Why not? And, um, and of course, these are, are cooked. So they dice up very nicely. If you prefer to use a, um, garlic press or something like that um please do so it's a little these are a little sticky but i am cutting these guys and being very mindful of where where i'm putting my fingers um, it's a little bit harder to do with the garlic but usually you know you try to make this little uh, uh, tuck, tuck the fingertips in to avoid losing them. That's no fun at all. So there we go. And then um, since these, these guys can also be smashed because they're so um, nicely cooked and the sweetness, you just smell the sweetness um, and not that typical garlicky pungency. So I will take this garlic that I have smashed and mashed and diced and put up a little bit more. Taking my fingers out of the way and now putting it in my prep bowl. I have to get my fingers a little wet to get all the garlicky goodness off of there. So that's what we've got. And I'm going to get rid of this knife, rinse my hands with a little bit of soap. And now that I've finished with the garlicky portion, I will set that aside. And now we can move on to prepping the lemon. So before 
uh, class today, I went ahead and um, took the uh, and washed the lemons and the avocado. Uh, I, I always wash the exterior of these um, of these products. I, I, I all all um, all fruits and vegetables. I always wash the exterior. All you need is a little bit of water, um, and you know just. Uh, uh, if there might be any bugs, especially if you're coming in from the garden. Um, you know, you want to wash them and dry them. And so that's what I did with these. Uh, and again, like I said, you know, especially with the, the lemons, what I like to do is um, do a couple at a time. This is my little zester that I love. Um, I like this one because it sits um, on the counter. And so when you're zesting, now we don't necessarily uh, need the zest for the recipe um you can't it's it's optional um but what i like to do is again set some aside and put it in the freezer um i add my lemon zest to uh cookies <laughs> i i add lemon zest to um salad dressings i add it to uh i make i often uh like to make lemon curd, which if you're watching your saturated fat, probably not the recipe for you, but a little dollop goes a long way. Um, and so you can make lemon curd. I prefer Meyer lemons because they are sweeter, but these of course are just your run of the mill, nice tart lemons that smell so amazing. And you wanna just give it, you know, each little patch, a nice little scrape, um, but not exposing too much of the white uh, pith because that does um, get bitter. And we are trying to do our best to cut the bitterness um, from this recipe. So here I'll do my second lemon real quick. And lemons are, uh, and, and all citrus, you could also probably use a different kind of citrus if you prefer oranges or lime, um, you know, get creative with the uh, with the citrus that you used for your vinaigrette. So here we go. With some, a little bit more. All right. So then, um, don't run your finger across the front and you know lose bits of finger, but you can go down along the back and kind of tap and get that stuff out. So now we have zested and we are ready to go with um, measuring. So now I'm going to use just a regular old measuring cup and I'm gonna make everything one to one to one. Um, so first with the, I need to get another knife out. With the lemons, so that we want to, we want to measure and see I'm tucking my fingers in. Um, with the lemons, I got this lovely little reamer, but you can use any kind of reamer you want. If you don't have a reamer, go ahead and use, um, use a fork and um and do the the uh, reaming with a fork and then strain out the pulp and the seeds with a, a small uh fine mesh strainer but this little thing i really like because it actually has a measuring cup on it so we have our other measuring cup there and i i hold the uh container still and then i'm a lefty so i'm using my left hand to squeeze the fruit and get as much of that um, juice as I can out of that thing. And there it goes straight into my compost pile. And let's do the second half. So out of one lemon today, we're getting a, about a quarter of a cup of juice. And then, like I said, I'm not going to use all the juice um, from from this today, but I will have a little bit extra for 
other recipes. I can put it on fish if I have some fish to put in the oven later. Um, you know, have it for a variety of uses. And you can also put it in a freezer safe zipper bag and put that in the freezer as well. This guy has a little bit more. There we go. Okay. So again, my hands are clean. I'll get some of this. This thing, this tool is wonderful, but it is not perfect. So I'm gonna, before I start pouring out my juice, I'm gonna take out some of the pith and seeds. Off they go. All right, and now, now what we're gonna do is do a, a one to one to one ratio of the liquids. This is my preference, of course, as you cook um, and, and you make the recipe, you can certainly make it uh, differently. We got out of two lemons, about a half a cup uh, of, of lemon juice. So I think what I'll do is a quarter cup of each liquid into my measuring cup. So there is the lemon juice. And we've got the olive oil. So I will get that up to the one half. I have an extra virgin olive oil. It tastes delicious. Good all purpose. Um, and again, that's some of that healthier fat, um, monounsaturated, monounsaturated fat, um, if I'm not mistaken. And this, and we know monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. And then uh, apple cider vinegar. I'm just going to add another quarter cup of that to the three quarter cup level. And now for the spices. Um, so like we said, we want to limit our salt. We'll talk a little bit more about that. This is my little salt cellar. Um, I'm going to do just a very small pinch, literally a pinch, and put that in the measuring cup. Um, and then I'm going to do, this is chili powder that we make, um, we mix at home. Uh, I actually have the recipe on my website. My uh, children are the one who, ones who now mix it for us and do their own, <laughs> their own uh, special blends. So what he, I have here, I think I'm going to do, I'm going to go a little bit on the spicy side. You know what? Let's start a little more reasonable. This is a quarter teaspoon of the spice. Now, you know, you can use a dash of chili powder or cayenne powder, or cayenne pepper, chipotle powder. Um, this chili powder has chipotle and um, smoked paprika and oregano and a uh, cumin, a variety of different um, seasonings. And again, I said it's uh, the recipe for that is on the website or just use your favorite store-bought chili powder. It, um, it's super versatile. Uh, just last night I took it and roasted a can of chickpeas at 400 for uh, 10 minutes and then stirred them and did another 10 and then another five minutes, so a total of 25 minutes. Um, a total of 25 minutes, and I roasted them at uh, 400. And I uh, had a, an amazing little uh, snack for uh, before dinner when the kids get hungry and want their hors d'oeuvres. So um, now what I'm going to do is put in To this, um, 
have. So what we have here is a lovely squeeze bottle. And I know we see it on TV, all the chefs have their squeeze bottles and um, a certain store in Woodbridge where you buy all sorts of amazing things that you don't know you need for your home. That's where I found some sets of these. And, uh, and they are actually coming in very handy. I've been making some um, homemade mayo mustard. And now they're also great for making a vinaigrette. So um, I like to read over my recipe, make sure I haven't forgotten anything. So let's do that together. We zested and juiced the lemon. Um, we measured the, the contents of our ingredients and added them to the container. Um, we added equal portions of the vinegar and the oil and the lemon juice. We added the spices and then um, we have the seasonings, the salt and the chili powder. So now what I'm gonna do is put this on tightly and cover it with my finger and really, really shake it. Now you can also use a blender. A blender would be super simple. It would, um, it would surely emulsify uh, probably a bit better. And then if it separates, you know, you can, you can shake this again. Okay, so we, and, and then the other thing that I always do in the kitchen, I have um, labels that dissolve. <clears throat> Excuse me, they come in little boxes. And these dissolvable labels, um, I actually do not use them for canning because when we, um, when we do the canning and preserving, we want to write with a Sharpie on, on the lid so that we remember not to use those lids again. Um, but when you are giving this as a gift, it is a nice thing to have on the outside also of the, uh, of the jar if you give it to someone. But these come in handy for all sorts of things like this lemon vinaigrette. And I put the date on it so that I remember, hey, you're gonna wanna use this within about a week. And we put it on right away. And then it just washes right off later. So there's our vinaigrette. And um, so let's put our salad together. Uh, we also need another knife. Uh, these are actually Kiwi brand knives. Um, you get, I think, two for eight dollars on um, on that that big website, and uh, and they are actually fairly good quality and super sharp. For uh, like I said, I mean, four bucks a piece is pretty good. I think you also might be able to find them at um, the Eden Center. Uh, supermarket if I'm not mistaken. I think I've seen Kiwi brand knives there before. So there's the, um, I cut the, the avocado in half. And then um, what I like to do is keep the avocado down on the, on the, the surface, flat surface. I just make some cuts vertically, horizontally. And then I personally do not like to get in there and hack at the at the uh, the pit. That just really makes me nervous. So what I'm going to do is I might lose a teeny bit of avocado in the process, but you know what? I'm okay with that because now I haven't um, chopped into my hand. And then I'm going to do the same thing with this side. I was kind of uneven in my halving of the avocado. So here we go. I wish you guys were here. Man, it smells so zesty <laughs> with, the, with the lemon. Let me rinse my hand real quick. And I also have my tomatoes here that I'm going to bring over at the same time. All right. And so the best way to get the uh, avocado, which um, is nice and ripe. Um, I know it was nice and ripe because that the little uh, this, this little guy came right out of the top very easily. And, um, and it was also a little bit soft on the outside, but not too soft or squishy. So I like to take 
a spoon with like a pretty thin edge and then just scoop in there and get that out. So there we are. We've scooped that pretty nicely. And then we'll scoop the next one. There we go. There we are. And scoop out all of that delicious avocado -y goodness. And we, you might have heard that avocado is the good fat, it's the polyunsaturated fat. Um, and as Aisha was talking about with the um, with the body parts and the benefits, you know, fat really helps us absorb nutrients. So um, fat and and um, fat is is just a very important part of our diet. Um, you know, like we said, you should get about you know a fifth to a third of your calories from fat. And again, go for polyunsaturated and fat and um, monounsaturated fats like olive oil, avocado fats and avocado, um, that sort of thing. So this is a great source of some of those fats. Now we've got our bowl of kale. All right, now I'll put the kale and I'm gonna put the garlic in. Just a little garlic. When the uh, dressing goes in, the garlic will be a little less sticky. All right, so again, I'm reading my recipe because I don't like to miss this step. Um, mince the garlic, put the kale in the garlic in a large bowl with a couple pinches of salt in the size. I put the salt in the vinaigrette, so I'm not gonna add any more salt. Um, and so usually we let this sit a little while so that the greens soften and get a little less bitter. Um, like Aisha was saying, you know, you add acids and things like that. Um, so I'm going to, and you can already see that this is kind of separating a little bit. So I'm going to shake it again and add this here. I just did a couple of squirts. And now with all that delicious dressing, I'm just going to do this to taste. Uh, again, all of this is to taste. This there, this is uh, not a prescription. This is a basic recipe where we've got smushing together all of these flavors. I smell the yummy acid. Now what I'm gonna do is take my avocado. It's easier to do it with the tongs, take my avocado. Right. And then not to waste a single bit, scoop off that heart healthy avocado and put it in there. Okay, next what I'm gonna do I have already washed and um, drained my tomatoes and I'm going to get a tomato knife. I know this this is a, a ridiculously large knife. It's serrated. Um, you can see there are, uh, this is a certain cooking show uh, that does a lot of testing in their kitchen. Uh, recommended this particular knife because of the way that the, uh, the ridges are on the, uh, the the way it's serrated um, so that you get nice clean cuts for bread. And then it also works really, really well with tomatoes. You know, um, you could really, it, this is another food safety thing, safety in the kitchen. You know, if you use a, a regular flat blade here, um, this does not cut very easily into the skin of the tomato. It's just not as safe. So using a serrated knife with tomatoes is just safer because those ser um, serrated tips can really bite 
into the tomato. And you see, I'm not holding the tomato like this and cutting into it. Please don't do that. Please keep it on the surface and just slice right into it like that. There we go. And I am going to put in a lot of tomato because I love it. Um, it's full of uh, lycopene, an antioxidant, um, you know, a lot of, um, uh, and there are also some other things called phytochemicals that um, we are just learning more about in the nutrition science world. Um, there are just so many great substances in nutritious foods. Like I said, we eat whole foods. We don't eat nutrients, um, but foods are made up of all these different nutrients. And then I'm going to take these nutrient rich tomatoes and toss them in my salad bowl. I'll bring my bowl over so you can see it. So now I'll just toss very gently. And now the part I really wish that you all were here for because, um, man, I really got a Got a lot of work to do to get this salad. Um, now the thing is that we also have off to the side, um, this salad just doesn't feel complete to me. Um, now you can add based on your preferences. I have pumpkin seeds. These are already roasted, lightly salted. And so um, I may or may not have been snacking on them already. I'm just gonna sprinkle them on the salad. All right, whoopsie, dropped one on the floor. All right. I really like crunch in my salad. So there it is. Mix those in. And then um, I'm going to taste it. Let's see how we did. Serve myself in one of these little bowls because. We are not going to be uncouth and eat out of the salad bowl. I don't even do that by myself at home. I certainly wouldn't do it if we were in person. So put that aside. And a giant fork for a teeny bowl, but I wanna get every little taste in this bite. But that's not gonna happen because the avocado is sliding around. pretty good. That's not bad. All right. Even though I made it myself, I'm telling you, it's good. I think it could use a little more chili powder in the dressing. I use the lemon, but not the zest. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I didn't want to use the zest in this particular recipe. I have the zest so that I can use that for another time. And again, if we were in person, I would not be eating this at the um, at the demonstration. There are just certain food safety rules that we have to follow as master food volunteers. Um, so please, uh, this feels more like a like a cooking show, and I've never done this before. It's a bit a bit unusual, but also kind of fun. So I wish you all were just sitting right in front of me. Okay. But there we have it, that's the salad. Now, what if I really wanna make this a meal? Last night, I made some extra um, whole grain basmati rice and um, I have some leftover. So I can make this into a rice bowl if I want. Um, just add that to the, add that to the bowl and then um, add a little bit more dressing if that's what I want. Um, but you know, one of the other things we have some some great protein from the pumpkin seeds, um, but we could also add these lentils. And I swear Trader Joe isn't paying me for this. Um, but these are um, absolutely delicious. They're beautifully seasoned uh, lentils, and you know this is a, a great source of fiber, um, protein. There's uh, a little bit of sodium in there, so you're probably want to going to want to scale back on any salt that you have in your recipe when you add these. 
but all you do is open up this package and there's a little plastic bag inside and you can heat it up in the microwave um, after venting it or um, I traditionally don't use a microwave and just you know heat it up in a, a, a pot on the stove in a pot of hot water. So um, now let's see here. Those are some some of the ideas I wanted to to walk through. And um, and so, you know, really that's it, it also the can of chickpeas that I did last night. Tossing those on this salad would also be delicious. Um, and that, that is about, um, that takes us to the end, I think, of our cooking demonstration. And so now, you know, if you guys have questions, I saw the chat going wild um, and uh, I would love to answer any questions that you have. Wow. Well, Stacy, that was fantastic. I have so many notes here. I learned so much from your session. And um, yes, we do have a handful of questions here. So uh, let's get started. Um, so one question was about the garlic press and, uh, or excuse me, with the garlic and whether because the garlic is toasted, um, is it still okay to use a garlic press or should we use a knife to chop the garlic if since it's already been softened? If, uh, you know, it'll just be extra squishy. <laughs> and, and so I think it would be okay um, to use the garlic press. It might even be easier. Um, I don't use one because it's just so hard to clean. Um, but I might, I might give that a, I might give that a try later because um, you saw me kind of struggling a little bit. Garlic can be, can be difficult. You can also buy garlic in, um, in liquid in the refrigerated section. Um, no judgment there, and they also sell frozen garlic in little cubes at the, uh, in the freezer section of the store. Cool. Um, another question was about the stems, because I know when we first started out with the kale, you were removing them. Um, is there any nutritional value in the stems, or is it just, in addition to it being tough, it's just not much there also in terms of nutrition? Oh no, there's plenty of nutrition in the stems. Um, you know, some folks, it, personally, I, I go ahead and, and put them in the compost. Um, and there, there's quite a lot of fiber um, in the stems. And you know, they're still part of the that that dark green, um, beautiful vegetable. And really the, what the what the darker colors, the deeper, richer colors have in fruits and vegetables, that um, it just means more nutrition. And so um, some folks set them aside, use them for smoothies. If you have a um, super mega blender, then um, it can, can cut up those fibers in the stems. You know, I say go for it and, um, you know, look for some, some recipes where uh, online where you can make some green smoothies with them. Um, and then that leads to another question we had, which was about compost. It's a little bit off topic, but you, you showed your compost bowl on the counter. Um, someone wanted to know whether you use worms in your compost or not. I have not done the worm composting yet. I've been using the county's green bin here in Arlington. Um, you know, now Arlington County has us, um, gives us the opportunity to compost. So I either put it in my green bin and take it out to the curb or um i i have a, a compost bin in the backyard that uh that is a mix of browns and greens so the greens of course are the the foods and um uh, food byproducts in the backyard though i cannot put bones and oil in the uh green bin with arlington county i can um so the it with in garland in arlington they say if it goes in the green bin um if it grows it goes uh but in in my own bin in the back i can only put in the uh food waste and then of course uh leaves and you have to have a good mixture of um of browns and greens uh and i think the uh, uh worm culture uh composting is a little bit different mm -hmm. so um the master gardeners might be able to speak to that um, and then this was asked and actually answered in the chat, but just in case folks missed it in the chat, can you just say the name of your website, please? Oh, sure. It's everyfoodfits.com. And um, the information on there is uh, all in line with, uh, you know, recommendations from my plate and the dietary guidelines for the most part. I used to write it with a dietitian, 
And um, of course, my my nutritional credentials now, now um, I have a master of public health in public health nutrition. Okay, great. Well, I think those are all the questions now for this section. Um, but yeah, so many amazing notes here, like freezing lemon zest. I never thought to do that. So thank you. Okay, we can thank move you. on. And you're hearing from me again. <laughs> so um, we have talked a lot about uh, vitamins, minerals, food groups, macronutrients, and but what we we what we eat are foods, um, as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier. So I'm um, just up here. I want to talk about you know one of the nutrition nutritious ingredients from the garden, um, from the farm market or the grocery store that you can use in this recipe. Um, and you know there's a lot of information up there, and you can read through some of these. I actually was very intrigued by the the fun fact that the tomatoes are botanically a fruit um, because it bears seeds. The Supreme Court decided in 1893 that they're a vegetable <laughs> and a vegetable can be any part of an edible plant. So I researched this a little bit um, and the court ruled that people regard tomatoes as vegetables, so they're vegetables, bottom line. Um, and as vegetables, they were subject to import tariffs, whereas um, they would not have been taxed at the time if they were classified as a fruit. So that is your interesting tomato, uh, interesting tomato trivia for the day. Um, but other ways to incorporate tomatoes and, and sort of get toward that um, target um, of two and a half cups of vegetables per day. You know, how do we actually do that? You know, for the most part, unless we have a medically tailored diet, we're not we're not measuring things into you know measuring cups. But um, you can add sliced tomato to a sandwich. Um, you can make a hearty tomato and chickpea stew with canned tomatoes. Um, you can eat just one large tomato on top of a green salad, like the one that we made um, today. And again, that's a great way to sort of work toward the goal of enjoying approximately two and a half cups of vegetables per day and um, making half your plate fruits and vegetables. And then um, pumpkin seeds. So we talked about this a little bit in the demo, so I'll go over it quickly. You know, um, pumpkin seeds are great because they are a high quality protein. Um, they uh, can be comparable to, to soy protein and contain all of the essential amino acids that um, that you need outside of meat. So, you know, this is a, a great complement for uh, folks who are vegetarian or vegan. Um, and uh, you can roast them, toast them on the on the stovetop a little bit until you just start to smell, you know, in a few minutes, you'll start to smell that that nutty flavor. Um, and, uh, and again, they are just uh, excellent for your health, um, for keeping things moving and getting some good um, additional fiber. And, um, and then there's, there's just a variety of health benefits. So now what I'm going to do is hand it over to Anne to introduce a couple more recipes for us. Thank you, Stacy. Um, just wanted to share a couple of rain, uh, recipes that are, again, easy to put together and also have a lot of nutrition and um, are, are delicious to eat. So, so this rainbow chickpea recipe is one that I often go to, especially during the summer when um, you know we're often invited to gather with other people or people are coming over on short notice, or even for those who have been working all day and just want something that's fairly simple to put together. Um, as Aisha and Stacy have already uh, mentioned, one of the um, benefits of using fresh produce from our gardens or the farmer's market is that they, the ingredients haven't had to travel very far. So um, when they're traveling, they begin to lose some of their essential um, uh, vitamins and, and minerals. So this, Salad, it calls for two tablespoons of red wine vinegar, one tablespoon of olive oil, and one lemon that's been juiced as, um, as Stacy was demonstrating in a, in a bit ago. And then either a 16 ounce can of chickpeas, or if you have um, access to ones that are not canned, that's fine too. About one half a red onion chopped, a pint or the equivalent of cherry tomatoes cut in half uh, safely as Stacy also demonstrated. One yellow pepper, 
chopped, two cucumbers, half cup of fresh parsley and salt and pepper to taste. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind with this recipe um, are that you can substitute almost anything in this recipe if you don't you happen to have all of the ingredients. So for example, if you don't have red onion, but you have some spring onions, you can chop those off and use them. Um, you can also use larger tomatoes and just chop them up. It, it's important to remember, as uh, Aisha and Stacy have al already said, that um, actually uh, these vegetables, especially peppers and tomatoes, have as much vitamin C as fruits do. So sometimes we forget that um, in, in looking for those things that can be supportive of the immune system. Um, you just whisk the vinegar, olive oil, and lemon together and um, toss the other ingredients and you're good to go for uh, an event outside. Or as I said, if you've just come home from work and you want something that is filling that provides fiber and, and good ingredients, but doesn't um, add on too many calories, then this is a perfect um, salad to, to reach for. Um, similarly, sweet potato hash, which can be a good um, cold weather recipe as well as, as warm weather, um, uses uh, a primary ingredient, sweet potatoes, which also have a lot of uh, nutritional benefits. And I think most people like the taste of them. Um, this requires some kosher salt, teaspoons of smoked, two teaspoons of smoked paprika, three cloves of, cloves of garlic minced, one teaspoon chili powder. And again, that can be chipotle or other kinds of uh, variations on chili powder, whatever you happen to have. A fourth teaspoon of dried rosemary crushed. Um, it's all, also okay to use fresh rosemary if you have access to that. Four medium sweet potatoes peeled and cubed. Two tablespoons olive oil. Two medium red and or yellow sweet potatoes chopped. I also um, uh, suggest that if you're using the sweet potato juice, uh, use red peppers just for a little more color. And then again, half a large sweet onion, thinly sliced, uh, two tablespoons of minced fresh thyme and olive oil. You put heat some oil in the skillet and when it's hot, add the sweet potato cubes and cover those and cook over a medium heat, heat for about 10 minutes or until the sweet potatoes are soft enough to pierce with a fork. You then add all the remaining ingredients, stir them and cook uncovered until tender and golden brown, which is usually about 10 or 15 minutes and then serve immediately uh, or keep leftover for uh, in, in, the, in an airtight container in the, in the refrigerator for three to five days. You could also serve this with rice or another grain if that were um, something you wanted to do. Um, just a reminder before we go to Trish and a couple more recipes that all of these recipes will be available after today. They'll be sent out to you. I think now I'll turn it over to Trisha, who's got a couple more suggestions. Yes, and Anna, um, I think we have a sweet potato theme here. <laughs> uh, this recipe is from the cookbook uh, whose cover you see on the screen. My mother actually picked this cookbook up uh, when she was uh, in an airport in Kentucky. It is a uh, different and light alternative to the traditional, what I find heavy and um, sorry for you, Thanksgiving traditionalist cloying uh, sweet potato casserole um, that served at, at, at Thanksgiving. Um, you'll note that it's chock full um, of uh, all kinds of nutritious foods, sweet potatoes, um, dates, um, pecans, oranges. Um, it contains some um, light mayo, um, some orange juice, and also some celery. It's very easy to make. And uh, when I serve it at Thanksgiving, people are always um, surprised. This is um, a recipe that I got from a Scottish friend, a little piece of trivia in um, the British Isles, they call zucchini courgettes. So that's um, uh, something you can um, uh, you know, take from 
today's presentation. This is a wonderful recipe um, for um, the, the hot summer months. Um, it also is a great way to use up. Um, you'll notice that it um, asks for five medium zucchini. Um, most of us who grow zucchini um, uh, have more than um, enough to share. And this is a good way to use um, a, a lot of your harvest. It's very easy to make. Um, it asks um, for uh, a, a blender, but um, I think you could also, uh, it would be chunkier, but you could also cook it um, uh, without a blender. Again, this is healthy. It's got um, uh, unsalted chicken stock. It also uses um, uh, basil, um, which is uh, uh, proliferating at the same time that the of zucchini is. And it contains non-fat yogurt and just a little bit of light cream. Thank you, Ann and Tricia. I appreciate you all providing your favorite recipes as well. Um, we did want to provide you some information about some local farmers markets. It is farmers market season. Uh, several of them are starting to come to be open or opening soon. Um, so here's some in the city of Alexandria and then the Arlington County. You'll know anything with the star. Um, those accept SNAP and EBT benefits and they actually double your dollars. So if you have $10 to spend, you can get tokens um, to then spend an additional $10 at the market. And most of these markets um, don't have a limit on how much, how, um, how often you can double your dollars, um, but it's a good way to stretch your dollars at the farmer's market. Um, those of the P represent ones that have master gardener plant clinics. Um, and I know the, at least the Fairlington Farmer's Market behind the Fairlington Community Center, um, there is a demonstration garden there as well, where they tend to have some events and classes um, throughout the season. Um, but make sure to visit these. These are great uh, for you to purchase local, um, locally grown produce if you don't have a local garden of your own, for example. Um, but take advantage of all these great resources out there um, and you know, ask all your questions at these plant clinics. And then one thing that we have been doing, there's the Plot Against Hunger program. I think most of you might be aware of this, but this is a uh, program that used to be through the Arlington Food Assistance Center that the Arlington Friends of Urban Agriculture has now um, taken over the management of. Um, and in partnership with uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension, with Marymount University, Master Gardeners, and Master Food Volunteers, and then local pantries in Arlington and Alexandria and Fairfax County, um, and then gardeners and, and uh, gardens, school gardens, for example, uh, and community gardens have been growing. So Plot Against Hunger, if you're not familiar with it, um, the concept is that you plant a row um, for your neighbors in need. And so um, in 2021, for example, over 9,100 pounds were donated, <clears throat> excuse me, at Rock, Rock Spring Church. And that is the church where we have been um, bagging these produce in the last two years. Um, and I believe we'll be using that site this year as, as well. Um, any updated information about this year's um, season will be at that uh, Arlington Ur Urban Ag uh, website. And then last year, 3,500 pounds were donated just to AFAC alone. And then an additional 39,600 ,000 pounds were gleaned from local farms. Um, if you want to get involved with this effort, you can help out by gardening. Um, Stacy helped out last year as well with her children by helping package the produce and delivering it to local pantries. Um, and it's a good way just to help out the community, um, learn a little bit more about some of the food coming in, um, you know, maybe from time to time, get some free seeds to grow food. Um, and then to, to just be aware about the, the, the need in the community. Um, you know, there is a great need for pantries to get fresh produce and local gardeners. Um, if you have excess produce, it's a great way to contribute to the community and, um, you know, share your bounty. Um, the Plot Against Hunger, they are having their spring garden kickoff uh, called Looking Ahead to Summer um, in May, Saturday, May 21st. Um, and this event, they'll talk a little bit about climate change, uh, an Arlington Heat Island study through Marymount University. Uh, they'll talk about the tool swap, um, the gardening advice, and summer seed giveaway. Uh, master Gardeners uh, will be there as well as the Master Food Volunteers. Um, so we hope you can join us at this event. Um, and then last, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy, who will talk a bit more about some other resources and some healthy eating strategies. Yes, thank you. Um, so as we finish up the session, we're focusing on number four in this graphic, 
Um, and that's and and I'll I'll tell you what it is because I know the the type is small. Um, we're going to talk about sort of setting some limits and being mindful of our saturated fats, the fats that are solid at room temperature, like butter and um, shortening and lard, um, and as well as limiting sugar and sodium intake. Most Americans exceed their consumption limits recommended by the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, um, on which my plate is based. Um, those are the guidelines that my plate is based on. Um, but we can change our behaviors, and with some of the ideas that we've mentioned throughout the session, and um, and then you know uh, when we get to Q and A, we want to hear from you about your strategies, or you can put them in the chat. You know, strategies to decrease saturated fat, added sugar, sodium. Um, but we all know that salt makes food taste good. So how do we cut the sodium without compromising flavor? Um, now, one thing, if you go and, and see the chili powder recipe, um, you know, one thing that, that uh, I use to get creative with salt reduction um, is MSG, um, which might surprise you. But in 2020, uh, the Journal of Food Science published an interesting study about how to potentially reduce sodium intake while maintaining the taste and pleasure for a variety of foods. Um, monosodium glutamate, a, a, AKA MSG, it's the sodium salt of the amino acid glutamic acid. Um, some of y'all may have heard of glutamic acid referred to as the taste that's recognized as umami or savory. Um, and, you know, there's even uh, glut glutamic acid in these tomatoes, mushrooms, a variety of foods. So um, the amount of sodium in MSG is actually one third of the amount of sodium in salt or um, NaCl. Um, so what the study authors did, did was they tested recipes using normal salt, reduced salt, and reduced salt plus some MSG. And about two thirds of the people in the study preferred the salt plus the MSG recipes, um, either the same or more than the normal salt recipe. Um, so adding small amounts of MSG to a recipe in place of salt can help limit sodium intake. And there are other ways too, such as using herbs and spices. Um, and, and again, we can you know, talk a little bit more about that as, as, we, uh, as we finish up here, because I'm, now I'm noticing the time, we've got about nine minutes to go. Um, and on to the next slide. Um, these are, again, these are gonna be sent out to you, um, but these are some great, tools, you know, my plate just started developing this kitchen recipe tool where they have, um, I believe I saw about 2000 recipes on there that you can search um, and search by different goals that you might have. Um, you know, nutrition's in, in, in nutrition and greens, um, I found a, a great resource from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, how and when to massage your kale, you know, kale needs love too, and um, makes it a little less bitter, I guess, like like most of us, um, <laughs> so a little love goes a long way. Um, so you can read that about how to uh, care for your kale. And then um, the food science and nutrition books that um, that uh, I would start out with if you're really, really interested in you know the science and the lore and um, and really the the food science uh, part of what we talked about today. Harold McGee's on food and cooking is marvelous. Um, I, I think most of my copy is has highlights all over it. And then the American, uh, I'm sorry, the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics, which used to be called the American Dietetic Association, they have a complete guide to food and nutrition. Um, that's an excellent resource. And now um, to Aisha for some more links. Thanks, DC. I was actually looking for my Harold McGee copy myself. Um, <laughs> So additional uh, resources through Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Family and Nutrition Program, um, the Eat Smart Move More website as pictured here. There's some resources there about, um, you know, how to take that, that produce from the garden and turn it into something in the kitchen or why it's helpful. Um, that's, it's a new series that they're doing on some tip sheets. Um, there's also some information on healthy eating on a budget um, and grocery store tours information, things like that. Um, the healthy eating from head to toe poster. I just put that link in there in case you're interested in that first visual that I put in there with a the little girl. Um, I just love that poster because on one side it has, you know, different images of, of the food. Um, and then on the back side, it has more information about the, the nutrients and that type of thing. Um, but it's a great one if you, you know, if you're teaching out in the community or if you, you know, have children or, or um, work with different ages. 
um, to get them encouraged and, and excited about different foods. Um, the Good Cheap Eat series or books, um, these are available in different uh, languages, but basically these are um, by a woman who created these recipes based on using SNAP um, ingredients at no more than $4 a day. So they're affordable and they focus on, on healthy ingredients. Um, this next handout on what do specific do, foods do, this is a little bit more in depth about um, you know, some of the information we provide about the vitamins, um, the minerals, that kind of stuff, if you want more information. Of course, the Master Gardener's website for how to grow this food. Um, and then the last website I mentioned, the Family Dinner Project that I mentioned before, talking a little bit about the benefits of eating together. Um, you know, they've, they've been doing this research for, I think, I think about 20 years or so. Um, so they have a wealth of information there as well. Um, and then lastly, um, if you'd like to join us and become a Master Food Volunteer, um, I was actually a Master Food Volunteer before I became an Extension Agent, and that's how I met Stacy. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. You get to do some great, um, you know, lots of cooking, lots of eating, um, and lots of, you know, working with the community. Um, anything from health fairs to food safety classes to cooking demonstrations. Um, if you're interested in Fairfax County, Katie Strong is the Family Consumer Sciences agent there. In Loudoun County, Stuart Vermack is the agent. Um, but we have Master Food Volunteer Program throughout most of the state of Virginia. Um, and then other states um, across the country also have them, the program as well. Um, so there's some links and some emails if you need them. But I'm gonna see if we have any questions now and turn it over to uh, Nicole. Okay, just a couple of questions um, for these last few minutes. Um, we had two questions on pumpkin seeds and one, whether they're the pumpkin seeds from the store are the same as the ones we used to see with our Halloween pumpkins, and then whether the pumpkin seeds that you use are raw or roasted. Oh, those are great questions. Um, these pumpkin seeds, uh, they might be from a different variety of pumpkin. The shape is just different. Um, the, the master gardeners might, might know a little bit more about varieties of pumpkin than I do, but uh, the, the ones that you pull out of your pumpkin and roast at home, those would be awesome on the salad too. And then I did use them. Um, these were already roasted and salted a little bit for me. Um, but again, you could really go crazy if you make your own pumpkin seeds. Um, and then another question was about how many servings of fruit a person should have a day. Um, they were unsure as whether it was two or three servings per day. Yeah, you know, it's it generally recommended, um, you know, two to three servings a day so that you, you it, the, the, uh, the slogan used to be more matters. So, you know, the more um, fruits and vegetables that you eat as part of your balanced diet, um, the better. And so again, aiming for um, at least, you know, uh, a couple of different kinds of fruit and a couple of different kinds of vegetables, ha eating the rainbow um, and eating more, more of those, you know, deeply richly colored um, leafy greens, carrots, tomatoes, that kind of thing. Sure. So the more the merrier, basically. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then one other question, I know that you said um, for pre-washed greens, you don't need to wash those again, but what about soaking cauliflower or broccoli in salt water, whether the cauliflower or broccoli is from the garden or a store? Hmm. I don't know that I've ever heard of salt water soaking. Um, you know, generally when I wash stuff, it's to get some salt off so that then I can add the amount of salt that I want to flavor my food. Um, and yeah, definitely, you know, um, do not rinse the pre the the pre washed greens that come out of the bag, um, because actually that's where some of the contamination can come from from um, from microbes in your sink. So uh, it's it's best to just um, you know wash the stuff that comes from your garden with just plain old water. Um, that's enough to get the dirt and the um, and the bugs that like to hang out under the leaves. And Stacy, I, I think the uh, idea of soaking those um, cruciferous vegetables in salt water is so that any critters um, are destroyed. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't do that. I just soak them a little bit in, in, in water and they float to the surface. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, those are our questions. Um, and I just, oh, sorry, one more popped up about uh, whether herbs are considered vegetables. Um, 
That's a long one. I know there's a lot of uh, discussion just in general about that. <laughs> What's the master gardener view that, uh, I mean, technically, I guess, yeah, herbs, herbs would be I vegetables. Would there are subset, that there are a subset of vegetables would be my answer. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I think they're um, certainly part of the leafy greens. So um, yeah, it, it would take quite a bit of them to, to uh, be equal to a, let's say a cup or a couple of cups of um, kale or or whatever, but yeah, I think you can count those as as your veg, green vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question about becoming a food master. I believe that um, you have those links and what you provided, and we'll be getting those after this meeting as well. And so you'll be able to find more information on becoming a master food volunteer. Um, if anyone's interested in becoming a um, Master Gardener as well, that information will be provided. Um, this presentation will be coming out um, after today's meeting um, and then the recording will be available in another two weeks as well. So Got thank it. you so much, everyone. This has been fantastic. Uh, it was fun for um, Nicole and I to be on here and see some cooking classes. I think I had as many questions as anybody else who was watching today. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again. I want to thank Nicole for um, assisting with the Q&A today and Patricia and Anne being on here. Um, and again, you can refer back to um, part one of this presentation, which was last week. That should be posted on our website soon. Um, and a great big thanks to Stacy and Aisha for the presentation. And we hope everybody has a, a lovely Friday and a terrific weekend. So thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye.